Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of Abdominal Pain in the ER, focusing on GI pathology. And I left you last time with a little bit of discussion about ischemic bowel, the importance of looking at the earliest changes of dilatation, bowel wall thickening, and then the transition to intramural gas and portal venous air. So the spectrum of disease. Now, one thing very important that I'll start with to remind everyone on every case, but especially when you're thinking about ischemic bowel, you need to look at the mesenteric vessels. Are they patent? And you need to follow the vessels down with not just at the origin where you can see here plaque, but the SMA and celiac are patent, but you need to follow things all the way down to make sure there's no occlusion more distally. You can see in this example, the SMA is occluded proximally with thrombus also in the patient's aorta. And you can see it very nicely on the sagittal view. Now, that's a thrombus. Now, what's interesting is we always look proximally for narrowing or occlusion, but it's very important with both celiac and SMA to look distally, particularly with embolic phenomena, Often the thrombus, the occlusion, is more distally than proximally, proximally being more atherosclerotic changes, but not always, as in this case. Here's a nice example with a significant occlusion proximally of the SMA, nicely shown in the MIP imaging, and also thrombus distally in the SMA. Here's a patient with abdominal pain, and what you notice is it looks like a non-contrast scan, but this is post-IV contrast. It's just the bowel is dilated, but not enhancing very well. When you look at it on the routine coronal, it looks like pneumatosis here. And then when you look at the sagittal view, you can see very nicely that the SMA and celiac at their origins look great, and the SMA about five centimeters down has extensive thrombus. Patient went to surgery, the thrombus was removed, and here's the patient a week later. Again, this is a wonderful example about how you need to see the thrombus and how extensive it is, but it's not in the proximal vessel, and it's easy to overlook. We see that all the time. Obviously, in this case, the bowel changes also made you think about that possibility. Another patient, look at the bowel thickening. It looks like concerning, and it was ischemic bowel. You can see, again, the SMA looks great, but then five, six centimeters down, there's extensive thrombus in the SMA. Oops, that thing likes to jump by itself. There it is. And here it is again on the volume rendering and on the axial. Looks great, celiac SMA. SMA looks great proximally, but look at the extent of the thrombus. Very important finding. Here's another example where when you start looking, the bottom line is that the abdomen looks pretty good. The SMA looks pretty good. But then when you follow it down, you could easily miss it, but there's occlusion of the SMA. But there's no inflammation nearby. There's no thickening of bowel. And your mind kind of, I'm not saying it wanders, but you don't notice this, right? You really don't notice it. But if you had the sagittal view, there's the SMA, there's the thrombus. Very nicely shown. Here it is a little bit better on the next part of the imaging slab. Again, very important. You have to look at the length of the vessel or you're going to miss occlusion. Very nicely shown there. Now, here's a good example of SMV and portal vein thrombus. You also see ascites. You also see stranding. As you scan downward, the bowel loops are dilated, but there's also inflammation in the mesentery. Remember, we spoke about fiber fatty proliferation of the mesentery and Crohn's, but when you have this haziness, it can be due to inflammation, but it can be due to inflammation due to ischemia, very nicely shown here. And then when you look on the coronal view, that look of long segment of bowel involvement, the vasa recta is small, the, the haziness, the inflammation in the mesenteric fat, which you see on the next image equally well. With ischemia, you often see long segments of bowel, which we also saw in Crohn's, but the appearance is different and the way it layers out is different. And then as you keep looking, there's the thrombus, portal vein SMV junction, but there is that loop of bowel, there's the free fluid, 
You can see it nicely also on the cinematic. Look at the different layers of the bowel. That's classic for ischemia. Look at the small vas erecta, very nicely shown here. When the vas erecta are small, you got to be thinking about a low flow state, and ischemia is the thing you worry about. And then the mucosal enhancement, submucosal edema, and the wall thickening all nicely shown on these images. Now, another thing to look at carefully besides vessel patency is the size of the vessel. In this case, with suspected ischemia, the SMA and celiac are both really tiny, as are their branches. And so a low flow state is what you're looking at. When you see cases like this and the SMA and celiac are that small, that alone makes me say, this is a low flow state. I'm worried about ischemia. No, I do not see vessel occlusion, but it's that vessel size that is most concerning. Now we mentioned looking at bowel. Here you see a dilated stomach, can be many reasons, dilated duodenum. Then you see these air bubbles and these loops of bowel here, and there it's more distal. Now this is pneumatosis of the small bowel. This is ischemic and infarcted small bowel. Now that's a dramatic appearance. The chance of this patient surviving is very low because even if you go directly to surgery, you're going to have a lot of infarcted bowel and you're going to have to do extensive surgery. Look how small the mesenteric vessels are. This unfortunately patient will die because of infarcted bowel due to ischemia. And again, look how small the vessels are. Just a really nice example and then showing you the full extent of the patient's pathology. Here it is in the coronal view. You also see portal venous air, which is another bad sign. Portal venous air, I mentioned before, perhaps, is not necessarily fatal, but it means you have likely infarcted bowel. Early enough, you still can save the patient, but it is a very ominous sign. And here's another example, pneumoperitoneum, really extensive air in the portal venous system. Uh, at this point, with this appearance, I know when I scan further down, the bowel is going to look terrible, and this patient is not going to do well. Now, another thing I wanted to comment on in this talk, and I've commented it on surely in my quiz cases, is looking at causes of small bowel that are iatrogenic. And when I say that, I think about oncology patients, post-BMT, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and then patients with treatment of high blood pressure with ACE inhibitors. So one of the challenges of this is the clinical history may not be complete. If you have a history of bone marrow transplant, then you should be in good shape. If you have a history of hypertensive drugs recently started, you'll be in good shape. But particularly with the latter, you're not going to have that history typically. So it's interesting because in these cases, the primary disease process may be masquerading treatment effects. There's an overlap of findings, but I'd like to share with you some cases so we recognize what we're looking at. Here's a patient with abdominal pain. You see multiple thick and small bowel loops. You could think of ischemia. You could even think of Crohn's on those few images. As you scan downward, it's very extensive, that halo sign in the bowel in cross-section nicely seen. The vessels do appear to be patent. And as we follow this down, would you really see the extent of involvement? Here it is on the volume rendered views, long segments of small bowel. The mesenteric vessels are patent, but now you have this really diseased bowel, ischemia, inflammation. What are we dealing with here? Look at the length and extent of those small bowel loops. When you find out this patient has had a bone marrow transplant, then it's easy to say graft versus host disease. Look how nicely this looks on the cinematic rendering, where you can see the thickening of the bowel wall, the submucosal edema, the prominent vas erecta, and how extensive the involvement is. Again, look at that cross-section of the patient's small bowel, which is specific for being abnormal but not specific for the type of pathology. And this was graft versus host in a patient with myeloma post bone marrow transplant. 
Another example, look at the mucosal hyperemia. It's particularly impressive in graft-versus-host disease, and here again is the cross-sectional look of the patient's small bowel. Now, there's been several articles about graft-versus-host disease. The CT findings associated with high-grade graft-versus-host disease with thickening of the distal esophagus, ileum, or ascending colon, as well as increasing number of thickened bowel wall segments. Findings include proximal dilatation, engorgement of the vasa recta, mesenteric fat stranding, mucosal and serosal enhancement, and ascites. So again, long segment involvements are things we're looking at. What about this case? Suspected GI bleed, thickened stomach, really thickened extensive involvement of small bowel ascites. We track it downward. Again, look at the cross sections of the bowel loops, that halo sign, the inflammation in the mesentery. Look at the prominence of the vasculature, the prominence of the vas erecta, particularly nicely seen on the cinematic rendering. And what are we dealing with? Again, another example of graft versus host disease. Now, when we speak about oncology patients, which we all do a lot of, it's important to really think out of the box when you look at these patients. Small bowel pathology, small bowel obstruction particularly can be due to anything from ischemia to perforation to enteritis to drug reaction. So again, an oncology patient is particularly going to be challenging. This patient is post-Whipple's procedure with abdominal pain. You are looking for an abscess. There's marked thickening of the distal bowel. Like most pancreatic cancer patients with surgery, patients often are getting chemotherapy. And look at that thickened distal bowel. So there are a range of agents, and there are multiple agents used for chemotherapy. Most patients are on multiple drugs, so it's not surprising these patients can develop chemotherapy-induced enteritis. It's interesting, sometimes patients have abdominal pain and CT findings to match. Sometimes patients are just getting routine follow-up and I see very impressive bowel disease. So sometimes patients have impressive bowel disease on CT, but are not symptomatic. Look at the extent of involvement in this case distally. Again, if, with the right history, you might have thought about ischemia. With the right history, you could have even considered graft versus host disease, but this was enteritis due to combination chemotherapy and culinating fulfox in this patient. Now, in this article by Marino, abdominal emergencies in cancer patients can result from the underlying malignancy itself, cancer therapy, or the results from the standard pathologies causing acute abdomen in otherwise healthy population. So again, you have everything that every patient has, plus so much more. Therapy-related or disease-related immunosuppression or high-dose analgesics often blunt many of the findings which are typically associated and expected in the non-cancer general population. This complicates the clinical picture, rendering the clinical exam less reliable in many cancer patients and resulting in different pathologies with clinicians and the radiologists must remain aware of. Very nicely shown in this article by Vishwatan talking about chemotherapy. And again, here are just some of the agents, but essentially almost every agent, 5-FU is one of the classics, the load is one of the classics, can cause chemotherapy-induced changes in bowel. And again, the use of multiple agents particularly makes it complicated. Here's a patient with chemotherapy-induced enteritis, another patient with pancreatic cancer. Long segments of bowel look very similar to other pathologies. So again, you may not be specific when you make the findings, but you can suggest, because the patient is on chemotherapy, and suggest that may be the reason. Very nicely shown, again, with the vas erecta prominence, small bowel involvement, and here it is really nicely shown on the MIP imaging, and then also shown very nicely on the cinematic rendering. So again, you may not always be specific as to your diagnosis, but you really could help the clinicians kind of narrow the diagnosis down. And again, classic chemotherapy agents target 
target rapidly proliferating cells. Molecular targeted therapies target specific key membranes. So it's very important for the radiologist also to know with some of the newer chemotherapies, as well as molecular therapies, what we need to be looking at. And again, the importance of not every patient is going to have symptoms. We may simply pick it up on a routine follow-up. Pneumatosis intestinalis is a radiologic finding, but it may be seen during chemotherapy. We always worry about pneumatosis as representing infarcted bowel, but it can be something that's seen with certain chemotherapy agents, and patients, in fact, can be asymptomatic. So if you see pneumatosis in a patient who is asymptomatic and you're doing a routine follow-up in a cancer patient, yes, make the point that pneumatosis, we're always concerned about ischemia, but that it can be a finding related to the patient's chemotherapy. And here's a patient with pneumatosis in jejunum following chemotherapy. So again, uh, something very important to think about. We talk also about radiation a radiation is within a port these days because radiation uh, is much more targeted. We don't see the radiation colitis and enteritis we used to see in the past, but we do see it, particularly in patients with radiation for uh, tumors involving the rectum, for GYN tumors where the dose is fairly high and the area can have lots of fibrosis and the, the bowel does not move because of that. So you can see radiation-induced changes. Chronic radiation enteritis can manifest on CT as bowel wall thickening or edema, ulcerations, fistula, and the like. So again, it's a very, very important diagnosis. Here's a nice example of radiation enteritis. Now, one of the things, of course, with radiation enteritis is you know the therapy ports. If the patient had radiation to the left upper quadrant or right upper quadrant, you're not going to see these changes, right? This is the pelvis, which means the patient had radiation in the pelvis. So you can look at what was radiated from the patient's notes and really then think of the possibility very nicely shown in this example. Now, we wrote an article way back when, Dave Blumke, more than 30 years ago, talking about radiation-induced changes. Again, we would see it more commonly in the past in the pancreas region, but again, with better therapy, uh, with better targeted and multi-port therapy, we don't see it quite as frequent in those areas. But we do see it again, GYN cancer, diffuse thickening in a patient being treated for cervical cancer. And here's just another example showing you the extensive involvement. So again, now we think about therapy, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, okay? Both of them can cause problems that are very, very important. Here's another patient, acute abdomen in the ER. And this ended up being due to medication as well, but was due to ACE inhibitors. So let's do this. We've covered a lot of ground in terms of chemotherapy. And now I want to go to medical therapy, something we often don't think about, but can present in the ER setting and can be very confusing. Remember, we'll talk about ACE inhibitors, but how do you treat someone with enteritis due to ACE inhibitors? You simply stop the ACE inhibitor and they're better within 24 hours. So let's take a break and we'll come back with part three and finish up the discussion. See you soon. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.